<clears throat> All right. So uh, this from George Washington. This is actually from his farewell address, um, 1796. I always thought his farewell address was something that he actually gave, that he you know, spoke, uh, but he didn't. It was a printed, um, like I, you know, written out and printed and published in several newspapers around the country. And it really was just to convince the population that he really was not going to run for a third term. And uh, he brings up this question, can it be that Providence has not connected the permanent felicity of a nation with its virtue? Felicity, of course, means happiness. So he thinks, you know, it, you know, is it that God has not connected the permanent happiness of a nation with its virtue? Again, here in the space of private virtue, George Washington talking about that founding value. All right. Oh, can it really be getting close to the midterm already? How can that be? semester is just moving right along. Yeah, someone um, put a question on Slack. What's the best way to study for the midterm? And that's when I realized I had not published the uh, midterm study guide, which I now have. So it's actually in the schedule here for October 11th. It's just a, a Word document that kind of goes over the things that I think that you should be familiar with to be able to do well on the midterm. Now, just to give you an idea about the relationship between this study guide to the midterm, I wrote the study guide before I wrote the midterm. I basically went through all the stuff that we've covered up to this point and said, what are the things that I, that I really care about the students knowing? And so um, I built those kind of you know, step by step into the study guide. And then I, I took that study guide and I said, all right, let's look at each line in the study guide. How do I write a question on the exam to uh, to you know, evaluate how well students know that particular topic. So the, mid, the, um, the study guide will be a great resource to you in terms of getting ready for that exam. Remember that that exam is going to be in the testing center and it is uh, basically runs most of next week. Is that right? Uh, Monday 11th, yeah, Monday through Friday of next week. So get over to the testing center and take that uh, at your convenience. Uh, I am going to offer a, let's see, did I put it here in the schedule? I thought I did. Let me make sure I'm on the right one, fall 2021. Yeah, so um, I thought I put it here in the schedule, but apparently I didn't. But I did schedule a, a, a meeting uh, for Saturday morning, so this Saturday morning, to be a review session. Yeah, so Saturday, October 9th at 9 a.m., we will have a, a midterm review session. So I'll just be uh, here on Zoom. We will go ahead and record that. So if you can't make it right at nine, you'll be able to watch what we came up with uh, later. Uh, but I, I don't have any agenda for this. This is just me kind of ready to answer questions that you might have from your review of the, of the study guide. So hopefully you had a chance to kind of look through that. And if you have any questions, bring those questions and uh, then we'll review those things to help prepare for the midterm. Uh, any questions on the midterm that coming up? Do my best to kind of keep an eye on chat. So the question was, what was the time? Uh, for the study guide or for the no, Sorry, is the midterm, is it timed? Oh, the midterm is not timed. So, but you do have to do it in one setting at the testing center. So, you know, if it, if you go in late on a day, it'll be however much you know, time you have to give the day, but it's not timed. Typically, students take um, the fastest ones finish in about a half hour. The vast majority of students complete it in less than an hour. There's always a few that extend it out for three or four or five hours. I don't know. They just they just must love this exam so much they really want to experience it you know fully. So, but uh, you you want to plan on you know somewhere around an hour. You should be in good shape. Okay, let's go ahead and get into today's content. So there is a file to download for today's class. So let's see, today is October 4th, looking at the various built-in functions. So go ahead and download transactions.xlsm. Now I, for the first time in my case, when I downloaded this file today, uh, it wouldn't open until I uh, you know, remove the blocking 
on it. So let me just, once you've downloaded that, let me just go ahead and show you what you have to do to get there. You may or may not have this problem, but whoops. Yeah, so I had to right click it and choose properties. Oh, and then unblock. Well, it might not have been this one. It might have been a different one. Yeah, never mind. You probably don't have to do that because I never unblocked it and it was working just fine. I think it was the, uh, I was reviewing the one from fall 2019 and that's the one that required me to uh, unblock it. So we should have that file open. And this will just be kind of the example that we're working with as we're working on various built-in functions. So a lot of the functions we'll be dealing with today uh, are going to be with uh, parsing strings. And so that's kind of why we have some of this data is filled out and some of it's not filled out. And we'll go ahead and be working with those. So of course, a function is, um, it's just a, it's, it, it's, um, it's an algorithm that returns a single value. And so there's lots of built-in functions in Excel. There are, are in, 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 of course, in Excel, there are two, uh, but in VBA. And so we're going to be looking at some of the main ones for parsing string functions today. And then we'll look at anything else that you might have questions about uh, here in particular. If I go ahead and open up my code window here, we should see that we've already got a subprocedure built here that just gives us a loop that's going to loop through this data on our transaction sheet. So the name of this sheet is TXN, that's the code name. And so it says transactions on the name of the tab. But if we look over here in the Project Explorer, you'll see that its code name here is TXN. So we're using that to refer to the sheet that we're after. And we'll be starting on row two. That's where R is starting. And we're going to be looping through this until we've gone through all the data by incrementing R to go down to the next row each time. Right now, we're just printing what's in column two, which is the full name. So if I just run this code, you should say that we're getting through and, and uh, printing out those 278 or 279 different values. All right, so uh, our first job then today is gonna to be able to split out this first name and the last name. And so to do that, we're gonna be looking at column B and there's several different ways that we can go about splitting this. So I'm gonna uh, start off by using the mid, the left function, the mid function and the in string function. So let's just go ahead and in this code here, let's see if I can find my, Preserved. Okay, so this is going to be uh, first. Okay, so the first function that we're going to use is we, to be able to split this between the first name and the last name, I need to find out where that comma is. And that's what's delimiting uh, this data. And so let me just go ahead and come right here and declare a variable. I'll call it uh, POS, that's short for position, as an integer. Actually, I could probably get by with a byte. I don't think any of the text we're going to deal with here is longer than 255 characters. So I'll do a single byte integer. All right, so now I'm going to use the instring function to get the value for position. So position equals INSTR. So the instring function. Uh, it takes uh, three arguments. The first one, uh, I wish it wasn't first. Let's start with the second one. So the second argument is a string that we're looking at. And the third argument is a string that we're looking for. So I'm gonna be looking at this data that's in cell, or that's in column B, first time through on in cell B2. So that's what I'm gonna put in for here. I'm gonna be looking for a comma and then I'm going to tell it where I actually want to start looking for it. Um, so that's the third one. So I'm going to say, listen, I want to start at the very first of the string. This becomes really useful if you're saying, you know, we've got a really long string here, and I don't really care about what's happening in the first part of the string. I'm not looking for an occurrence of one string inside of another at the beginning. No, maybe I only want to start looking after the first 100 characters. 
And so that's what this first argument says, which character do I wanna start looking with? And that's for us, we wanna start looking at the very beginning. The next argument is the string that we're looking at. And so that will be just the value that's in that cell. And then we're after the value that we are looking for. So we're looking for a comma. This looks a little bit strange because I'm using a comma to separate the arguments here, but one of my arguments is a comma. So I've got a comma set here in double quotes that says, listen, find the comma in what's ever in this cell, start searching at the first character, and then return the position of this. So I'm gonna go ahead and just put a breakpoint in here and I'll run the code to that point. So I expect that to find the comma at the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight position. Let's just see if that's actually where it found it. So that POS, ah, oh, looks like we didn't find it. What do I got going on here? I think you need to change your column number to two. Oh, I'm looking at column one, thank you. Let's try that again. That looks better. Okay. So that tells us where then we have found that, uh, where we found the, the comma. So now that I know where the comma is, I can use my other functions. In this case, since I'm looking at, oh, let's see, why don't we do, we do last name first. So in fact, I'm gonna just pull this down. So what I want is I just want the left most characters. In this case, the left most eight characters or maybe seven. So I'm gonna go ahead and write here into column C. Something doesn't quite seem to be feeling right about my editor. Okay, so I'm gonna write into column C. And I'm going to use the left function. The left function takes a certain number of characters off the left of a string. And so it takes two arguments. One is the string to look at, which is going to be whatever we've got in the current row on column B. And then it says, how many characters do we want to take? And so I'll just go ahead and use position. Now position is eight. I think it's probably gonna actually get the comma as well. One, two, three, four. Yeah, there's only seven characters there in brand. So I don't want position. What I really want is position minus one. Uh, and so that should, that should go ahead and put that last name in. Oh, but I don't want it to go in C. I want it to go in D. Ah. Oh. Excellent. So let me just go ahead and run that one out now. And we're pulling off all of the last names from that full name, putting it there in column B. Any questions about how either in string function works or about how the left function works? All right, let's go ahead and pull off the um, first name as well. And so that's gonna go in column C. But instead of using left, hmm. You might be tempted to use the right function here, and we certainly could use the right function here. 
the math will be a little bit more complicated because we have to calculate how many characters uh, there are to the right of the comma. So what, what we know right now is we know where that comma is. And if we say we want to take the rightmost characters off, we gotta, we'll have to do some math to figure out how long it is, subtract that from where the comma was, and then probably make another adjustment on that to figure out what that is. However, there's another function called mid that will um, do quite nicely for us. Okay, so instead of left here, I'm gonna choose mid. I'm still looking at that same, at the same full name. And then I'm going to choose position plus one. I don't want the comma, probably position plus two, because I don't think I want that space either. So if I start on the eighth character, it would start there. And I, I want to start at the 10th character for this one. So that'll be position plus two. Now, normally the mid function says, hey, take a look at the string, start somewhere in the middle. Where are you starting? You're starting at you know, whatever number you supply here. And then, you know, you could say, you know, take the next five characters or take the next 50 characters. We'll tell you how many characters to take. But if you omit that argument, it'll just take the rest of the string. And so the mid function in this case will say, great, we're gonna look at that whole, that, that full name. We're gonna go to the second character past the comma. So we'll, we'll go over the space and we'll start on that capital C and then we'll pull out that first name. And let's see. Should just be able to run that and it should bring in the first names as well. All right, looking for any questions on chat. Oh, Spencer, thank you for letting me know I needed to change my, uh, change which cell I was looking at. I don't see anything else in chat. Any other questions maybe from the classroom? All right, let's just so we can get some experience with the, uh, with the right function and the length function as well. Let's go ahead and maybe look at the other way that we could do this. So I'll copy this line. And instead of using the mid function, I'm going to use the right function. Now here, I've got to figure out how many characters there are. So maybe I will run it right up to this point. We'll do a little snooping around. Okay, so my position is eight. What is the overall length of that string? So the len function just takes uh, really any expression and tells you how, how long it is. So there's overall there's 16 characters. And what I'm really after is C-H-I-L-T-O-N. So I need those seven characters. So it looks like I need to take the length minus the position and then subtract one more off of it. Is that right? So take the length minus position, minus position. That's gonna give me eight and we'll subtract one more off. That should give me the number of characters that I need to take if I'm just using the right method to get it, the right function. Instead of position plus two, it will be the length of that same string minus position minus one. Let's go ahead and clear out this first column and then run that again. So another way to get at the same uh, value there. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Now, what I'd like to do here in the phone column is I would like to look at 
Um, this, uh, this one standard approach to doing a phone number, I'd like to convert it to this approach where we put the parentheses, where we put parentheses around the area code. So 520 space 206 hyphen 6847. All right, so the one that there's a function that really lends itself to this called split. Unfortunately, split is uh, split is going to return something called an array. And we have, I haven't taught you what an array is yet. We're still going to go ahead and use the split function today. There'll be some part of it that may seem a little bit mystical to you because we haven't really covered what's happening in the background or, or the, the actual value that it's returning. But I promise to, to do that. It's uh, coming up, we're actually gonna spend two days on the concept of what an array is. Let's just go ahead and see how we might use the split function today, even though we're not gonna fully, uh, even though I'm not expecting you to fully grasp everything that's happening on this one. So instead of stop, let's go ahead and do phone number. Okay, so this is going to be column F. And we are going to split whatever is in column E. So what the split function does is it takes a string, um, it takes a string and it takes a delimiter. So in this case, I'm gonna put a hyphen in for the second argument and it's going to return an array of values that this string gets chopped up into based on the delimiter. So this is going to return three values. It's actually, technically it returns one value. The value is an array. But that array will have three values in it. So let's go ahead and just put here that we want to take one of them out. In fact, let's do this. Maybe let's run to this point. I'm not sure let us run this far. Yeah. Okay. So let's just take a look at what this split is going to do. So if I try to print this, it's gonna tell me straight away that it doesn't like it. Type mismatch, it's not a very helpful error message. But it turns out that in, in uh, the VBA environment here, we cannot just print an array. We have to tell it which element of the array that we want to print. And so I'm gonna tell it, all right, I wanna print the, the first one, number one element. And so that gives me 206. Hmm. Why is that giving me the second one when I asked for the very first element? And the answer is that in VBA, oh, arrays begin counting at zero, which seems a little bit strange because when we've worked so far with collections, they begin counting at one. But in this case, we've got zero. So the first one is zero. The next one is, uh, well, then strike that. So the zeroth position is five, two, zero. The number one position is 206. And the number two position then should be the third part of that. Okay, so now I realize that if I put here in parentheses after this call, uh, put a zero here, that will pull that area code off. So that's looking pretty good, but I do also want to get those parentheses in there. So I'll go ahead and put an opening parenthesis, an opening parenthesis, and concatenate on uh, the area code and then a closing parenthesis. And 
that doesn't look so good. What did we do here? We're looking at E. <laughs> I don't see what I've done wrong here. Okay, so f is going to equal this with split that. Let's just see what this is giving us. Seems like that's just what we were looking at here moments ago. The m on that current column r is two. Okay, that's putting in the parenthesis. That should be putting in the area code. I'm not sure what I had going on. Oh, I see what it's doing. Uh, is looking at those parentheses. <coughs> and it's assuming I'm using those parentheses to indicate that I want a negative number here. So it's, this is just Excel converting that 520 into a negative number. That's okay. Once we get the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the phone number on here, uh, that won't happen. So let's go ahead and put a space here. And then let's concatenate on the next two elements. So I will just go ahead and split that and take the second element, or the number one element, concatenate on, let's see, and I'll go ahead and Put on the hyphen. And then we'll take the number two position. We've got zero, one, and two. Let's go ahead and stop this. I'll bring this so it all fits onto one screen. Line continuation, that's okay. And if I run that, I think we're gonna see that it then goes and reformats that phone number the way that we want to. Except for one thing, what's the problem? Looks like we've got a space here in front of the five, uh, in front of the area code. Well, good news is there is a function to just to deal with uh, leading and trailing spaces. So we'll use that. So right here is where we're pulling out the area code. And so what I'm going to do here, in fact, I may, yeah, this should work just fine. I'll just trim this here. There's a function called trim that just takes off any leading and trailing spaces. So I think that should get rid of that trim. Oops, I don't want the trim to be on the outside of the split. Actually, I wouldn't mind it being on the outside of the split. I was going to put on the inside of the split. So let's trim this right here. Yeah, that looks better. There we go. Let me go ahead and just highlight the argument that's inside the trim here. So you can kind of see the whole call to trim. So trim just says if there's a space in the front or a space in the back, just go ahead and get rid of it. Uh, not just a space, but any number of spaces. 
So let's just go ahead and put some kind of a string here. Just spaces on the front. One of my favorite songs, to Nephi Seer of Olden Time. We've got some spaces on the front. Just so we can kind of see those spaces a little bit better when it prints this out. We can catenate on a capital X in front, a capital X in back. So we can see that even though I've got all these spaces here, trim takes them off both the ones in the front and in the back. There is, if you're only interested in the ones on the left-hand side, there's another function called L trim, which will trim leading spaces. And you might also imagine there's an R trim, which will trim trailing spaces. Any questions on the trim function? The underscore is that different than the other day when we were using the underscore in the lines? Is that like, do you have to have a space there? Right. Yeah. So this underscore is just because I've got a long statement that I want to break onto two lines. So the space needs to be before it and then the underscore. Okay. Yeah. The truth is, in my code, I almost never break long lines. I just leave them going off the page and I'll scroll over and look at them if I want to look at them at some point. But knowing that you're trying to, that many of you are trying to keep up with what I'm doing so you can have your working examples, um, I'll try to break them on so that they're all, the, so they're all on the screen together. Okay, what if I had like, extra spaces in the middle that I wanted to give. So if I'm going to go this back to trim, trim takes all the ones at the beginning at the end, but doesn't touch any of these that are in the middle. Ah, oh, is there anyone here who's familiar enough with the functions that are built into Excel, not to VBA, but built into Excel that knows, oh yeah, there's a function that does just that. There is, there's a function that will do what trim does here. But not only that, it'll take any time we've got multiple spaces inside of a string and it'll collapse those down to a single space. Do you know what that function is? Substitute. Substitute, I think lets us look for a character and replace it with another character. This one is specifically dealing with spaces and it will take off leading spaces, take off trailing spaces, and it will condense spaces on the inside to um, sequential spaces on the inside of the string down to a single one. Uh, let's just go ahead and maybe I'll modify this one temporarily here. Put a bunch of space here before Huntsville, put some spaces after it, put some spaces before it. So yeah, there's actually, a function called trim. It's the same name as the one in VBA, but it behaves quite differently. You know, it still takes the trailing, leading and trailing spaces, but it deals with this spaces in the middle as well. Well, it turns out if that's the functionality that you're really looking for, then you know we can we can actually invoke those functions that are built into Excel from VBA. So let's take a look at how we would do that. So instead of using trim here, I'm going to say worksheet, worksheet, worksheet function dot trim. When I say worksheet function, what I'm doing is it's an object that I have availability to in VBA, but it's just an object that has built as methods all of the functions that are built into Excel. So there's a lot of them. 
And, you know, if there's something that you know how to do in Excel and you're thinking, hmm, I wish I could do that in VBA, the answer is you can. So now I'm calling the trim function that's built into Excel with the worksheet function object. And that will collapse out this extra space here in the middle. Uh, there's a couple of caveats here with the worksheet function. Um, one in particular that I wish they had done differently, but let's take a look. So let's uh, do a worksheet function dot uh, rand between. So rand between gives us a, uh, it chooses a, a random integer from a normal, I'm sorry, from a uniform distribution, um, beginning with the first number we give it and ending with the second number. So it's just randomly picking a number between one and 10 each time I run this. See a question about application.trim uh, and we'll take a look at that here in just a moment. So let's take a look at, uh, so I'm invoking rand between. Now, what is the function in Excel that just gives me a random number between zero and one pulled from a uniform distribution? Does anyone know the name of that function? It's, it's actually just rand. So that's gonna give me, um, oh, sorry, let's come over here and do it here. This is, yeah, this is the, what I'm trying to point out to you is the thing I dislike about this. Great, put in the wrong place. All right, so that just gives me <clears throat> a random number between zero and one. Um, however, if I come here to worksheet function dot and look for rand, it's not here. Wait a minute, why is rand here? And the answer is, that because there's a function already built into VBA that does that same thing, you're not allowed to invoke the one from Excel. Presumably because it's going to be more efficient uh, if you call it from the native environment. So if, if you're wondering why isn't there, why, why is this function not available? The reason it's not available is because there's a native function for it built into VBA. And it might take a little extra Googling to figure out exactly what that function is, um, but that's, that's just kind of a little warning about that. Okay, so we have a question over here in chat. Uh, can you also use application.trim? Will that also allow you to use Excel's trim function? So most of the, <clears throat> most of the functions that we are invoking, we can actually prefix with application. So let's just go ahead and call application dot trim and application dot a p p l i c a t i o n and let's put something in here big long spaces hello world now the question is will it take out will it compress those down into one. My guess is no, this is actually going to invoke VBA's trim function. I'm not sure. No, it did, you're right. So um, uh, Keegan, really interesting. Um, I was unaware that you could call trim from the application object. Hmm, it makes me wonder if you can get to the other ones that way too, that would be so interesting. Yeah, wholly unexpected. So that's neat. Yeah, it's apparently it's invoking the same functionality. I had never seen that way of accessing those functions. I like it. Okay, other questions here?
All right, let's go ahead and parse out this long street address into city state zip and postal code. So, yeah, I think I want to use the split again because we're splitting by this comma. So let's go ahead and, in fact, let's do this. Here's phone number, so let's do address. So when I was using split up here, I'm calling the split function and I am then immediately telling it that I want to take the number zero, the number one, or the number two element off of that. Well, it turns out I can store the interim return value from this split function. I don't have to split each time. I could split it once, put that into a variable, and then just refer to which part of it, you know, which element in the set that I want to do. So again, this should be a little bit mystical to you until we've covered arrays. But for right now, let me just declare a variable called address. I'll do this as a variant. Now I'll say that address is going to be equal to, let's see, we're now column G. And we're going to split that based on the comma. And we'll split. Actually, it looks like there's a comma and there's a space after it. So I'm going to make the delimiter to be two characters. So if you've ever uh, had to work with some particularly, um, or had, had, have had to do a lot with the columns, one of the things that's really deficient about text to columns, in my opinion, is that when you come and say, I'm doing this delimited, one, you can't do a multi-character delimiter. So your delimiter is going to be a single character. In this case, we want to be able to split. You know, I don't want the, if I split just on a comma, then I'm going to have a leading space on everything else. But over here on my split function, I can say, no, I want to split based on a multi-character sequence. And so if you find yourself struggling with uh, text to columns, you have a little more control using the split function. Of course, it does something very, very similar. All right. So now let me go ahead and run this to this point. And so address now is holding the interim value that comes back, that whole set of values, that array of values that this address gets split into. So because I'm in break mode, I should be able to come here and say address and look at the zeroth position and that should bring back the, uh, the street address. And somehow, oh, I'm looking at column B and I should be looking at column G. Um, so rather than having to split each time I want to pull a value off of it, I can split it and I'll hold the results of the split here. And then by using address with an index number, tell it which part of that result I'm after. All right, so street address city state, that should be pretty straightforward. H, I, J, H, at least H and I will be pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and put in column H, uh, is just going to be address one, no address sub zero. This is <clears throat> H. And I should be sub one. And run those two. All 
the address city. Now, problem with state is that there's no comma before the before the um, zip code. So what I have in my third position now of my address is actually the state and the zip code. All right. So at this point, I think I'm probably done with the first part of the address. So I'm just gonna go ahead and reuse that address variable. So I'm gonna say address equals split. Now I'm gonna look at the address two. I mean, this is, this is the next part that I'm after address two here. So I'm gonna split address two. Now this time based on, oh, trouble with basing this um, by just splitting this based on a space is I'm gonna have a problem when I get to a city like New York. Uh, because I need to split this based on the occurrence, the last occurrence of the space. So I can't just, I don't just wanna split this because if I split it, then I'm gonna end up with my zip code in the number three position or the, I'll have new in the number zero position, York in the number one position and the zip in the number two position. Hmm. So let's just go ahead and look at this one called in-string reverse. So we've seen in-string that tells you the position of one string inside of another string. Well, in-string reverse does the same thing. It just, instead of looking at the beginning of the string, it looks at the, it starts looking from the end of the string. So I-N-S-T-R-R-E-V. Uh, this one, interestingly, doesn't tell us where to start looking from the back. It assumes you're starting from the very back. So we're going to be looking here at address two. We're going to be looking for space. And that should tell us where it finds it. And it's not liking what I have here. So let me comment this out. So it tells me that it found that. Uh, in the eighth character. Now, it is not the eighth character from the right, it's the eighth character from the left, I think. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah. So even though I'm looking from the left, it reports to me the position that it finds, finds it from the beginning of the string, not from the end of the string. Okay, so what I can do then is I can use Rather than, rather than splitting it again, so this was a, oops. this was a bad idea. But here now, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just write into column J. Let's go ahead and set our position variable equal to where we find that space. And so now we want the first half of this, so we'll use left of our address number two, the last segment of the address. Uh, address number two, and how many characters do we want? Position minus one. And that should go into column J. Let's go ahead and run that and see if it does it right. Help if I had that spelled correctly. And it looks like it gives me the state of Alabama, no space on the end. So let's just go ahead and use something similar to get the postal code. So that would be H I J K. And we'll use the mid 
of address two beginning at the position plus one. And that's got our postal code. Let's go ahead and run these out. And then we'll see the problem that's gonna arise. Uh, and we see the problem right here. So postal codes are, they're numeric, but they're always five digits, which means that if we've got a leading zero, we've got to show the leading zero. And when we write something with a leading zero, oops, like zero, two, four, five, eight, zero, two, four, five, eight, Excel looks at that and says, oh, you silly user, don't you know that the zero on the front of a number doesn't mean anything? And so it takes it off for us. Um, and the reason is, is because it's actually storing that as a number. And if it had to, to store the fact also that on that number, you want to keep some, some leading zeros in front of that, it's going to make things a lot more complex to store it internally. So it says if it's a number, we're going to show it as the simplest way we can show the number, which means no leading zeros. Uh, so. Let's just go ahead and do one more thing on the this will be column L. I'll just go give myself another comment here, full postal. Uh, and you can kind of you can get around that. You can force text to be you can force numbers to be respected as text by putting a single quote. Oh, that's really ugly. By putting a single quote in front of them. Let's take a look at that before I run this. Let's come back. Oh, what have we done? Yeah, so if I came here and I was to put in a single quote and then a zero, then it recognizes that as uh, characters rather than a number as as text data and so it shows that it, it stores it as text so we get the zero in front interesting thing is that it's not like oh wait you've actually put a single quote in the value of that cell no you haven't because if i was to ask for what the uh, value of the active cell is this is really kind of a strange thing about excel Active, oh, dot value. You can see that when I ask for the value of that cell, that single quote does not come out um, because it recognizes that that's just me trying to communicate to Excel. Oh, by the way, the value here is zero, two, four, five, eight. But I'm just trying to convince it to treat that as text rather than as a number. Uh, okay, so that's what I'm gonna do to get the full postal code. Uh, is is to put that single quote. Now this is really pretty bad because it's a double quote, single quote, and a double quote. So I think I think character character number thirty nine is a single quote. Yeah. So instead of trying to use it as a string literal, there's a function I can call. It's called char. I don't think I've introduced this one to you yet. That if you know the ASCII value of a letter, then you can give it the number and it will give you the letter representation of it. So uh, capital A is 65, or case Z is what, 128, 127, 120, I don't remember, 124. I don't know. Um, capital B, of course, is 65, 66. Uh, exclamation point, I think, is 33. So, yeah, I haven't memorized the whole ASCII table, but there's a few that, that I'm familiar with. And so we can, in cases where it makes our code better, instead of just doing a string literal by having it in closing double quotes, you can say, no, I want to put in character 39 here. 
So that's another way to get to that single quote character. All right, let's go ahead and run that. And then I think that will give us yeah, our postal code. And where's the one? Here we go. Yeah, so this one, you'll see that we've lost the leading zero in postal, and then we've got the leading zero now on full postal. Questions to this point? So my code is working fine. The difference is when I do, when I ask it um, how, what the value is at, um, on address two, um, sorry, in where the space is, the position in string rev. Yeah, that's a nine for me instead of an eight, but it still prints everything normal. So let's see. So of course it's going to it's going to depend on which line we're on, and I might have already advanced to the next line. I'm not sure. Oh no, I think I see what it is. It's probably because you're splitting based on a comma rather than the comma and the space. If you split on the comma, you just scroll over a bit. If I split this based on a comma, then the first character of this next one is going to be is going to be a space. But I'm actually splitting on a two character sequence here, comma and then space. And so the space and the comma then will both be taken out because it's the delimiter. It won't appear in any of the data set that we have. Does that help? Is that what was I right? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, so you said yours was working, but it, it, but the, what that meant is it was putting a lead, it was it was putting a leading space on both your city and your state. So good. All right. Let's see what's next over here. Oh, we've got some dealings with the email. Oh yeah, this is one, this is kind of the bane of my existence. Let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, and here at email. So we are on M2, active, that's our active cell. So let me just see if I can look at what the leftmost, if you look at this, you'll probably see that there's, <coughs> there's a space at the beginning of this data. So let me look at the active cell. Uh, value. And maybe I'll just put a capital X in front of it so we can see. You can definitely see we've got something going on here. So let's go ahead and trim that and see if we can get to go away. Uh, and the answer is no. That space is somehow impervious to the trim function. What kind of an evil, wicked space is that? Ah, oh, this is exactly how, like when I export your emails from, um, from AIM, like when I go, oh, I gotta get the emails from my students. It comes with this kind of a strange character here at the very front of it. So let me just see if I can find out something about what that character is. So instead of trimming it, let me look at that. Let me just look at the leftmost character. Leftmost one character. Don't see much there, but now that I know I have just that character, I can ask what's it, what it's, what's the value of that character in the ASCII table. So ASC says, give me the ASCII value 
of that. That is character number 160. Yikes. Um, what is the ASCII value of a regular old space? 32. So a normal space, the, the space that the trim function will take care of is character number 32. And yet somehow this space character is character number 160. Well, it turns out character number 160 is the non-breaking space that we use in HTML to be able to say, there's a space there that I don't want you to collapse. I mean, normally in HTML, uh, it collapses all um, spaces, uh, kind of all vertical and horizontal white space into a single space. But when we say, no, 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 we, want, we really want there to be a space there, we'll use character number 160 or a non-breaking space. And so unfortunately, it ends up being a space that looks like a space. Uh, and because we do so much stuff, kind of moving data in and out of HTML, it ends up being a character that we have to deal with from time to time. So let's just go ahead and see what we would want to do to be able to get rid of that beginning space. Almost looks like there's two spaces at the beginning. Let's see. Okay, let's try it up here. There we go. Yeah, so it looks like there's two spaces. I'm not entirely sure that they're both 160. So let's take a look at the, Let's do the left, let's use the mid of this, starting at the second character and taking one. Yeah, so starting at the first character and taking one, second character, starting at the third character and taking one. So let's say we've got two 160s then followed by the email address. So 99, apparently lowercase c is number 99. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to replace all occurrences of character number 160. Hmm. I could either replace them with a space, which would convert the non-breaking space into a normal space that I could then deal with, or uh, I could just go ahead and get rid of them altogether. Fortunately, there is a function that's meant just for that. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. So in this case, we're going to be looking at the email address. So this is going to be column N, and we're looking at column M. Here we go. All right. So this is the string that we want to do something with. And so I'm going to call the function called replace. So replace says, we are going to look at some string. Here's the string we're looking at. We're going to find something and we're going to replace it with something else. The next argument, uh, which I almost never use. Oh, yeah, where do you want to start again? Are you going to look through the whole string or only starting after a particular character? Uh, you, can, you can ask how many you want to find. Just do the first, do all of them, do the first two, whatever. Uh, and you can even tell it if you want to match case or not. So this last argument here lets you say, if it's a binary comparison, case is going to matter. If it's a text comparison, case isn't going to matter. And I think the database comparison looks at some other setting on your system um, to decide whether case is going to matter or not. But let's leave all those, extra, all those extras off, and we're just going to say we are looking for now here, I'm gonna say we're looking for character number 160. And we're gonna replace it with a zero length string. And so that should get rid of those leading to spaces. And if they had, I guess it would have been just as fine to use the mid function here to start at the third character because oh, I'm not entirely sure there's always two characters, but it looks like there's always two characters at the beginning. 
Well, this way just says, listen, if you've got a 160 in there, get rid of it. Um, so let's go ahead and run that. Yeah, I think that will have taken care of that. Yeah, so that's gotten rid of those two leading invisible characters. Questions? All right. What else we got going on here? So the WMI, the World Manufacturer Index, I think is what that stands for. Uh, the WMI is the first three characters of a VIN. So let's just go ahead and plug in the WMI. So let's see. So we're going to be looking at the VIN, which is in column R. We're going to be writing it to column B. So column B is going to equal what we're finding in column R. And nothing new here. That's the left three characters. Uh, let's see, and then the year. Is, I think it's just the 10th character, is that right? Anyone know a lot about uh, the, the identification numbers? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, I think the 10th character indicates what's, what the year is. Uh, and I think I've got, like, yeah, some built-in functions here that once we get the WMI in the year, it'll actually pull this information off of other tables here in the workbook. Uh, I hope that's right. If the years look really strange, it'll mean I've got the wrong. We'll have to go look at the Wikipedia and find out which character that is. Yeah, I just looked it up. It's, it's the 10th character. Oh, thank you. So let's see, I'm going to be looking at uh, RSTUBW. And this will be the mid of R starting at the 10th character and taking one character. I think this will fill out our table. Yes, yeah, so we get the country the car was manufactured in our manufacturer and then the model year at least look right. 2010, 2012. Okay. Well, let's see what other built-in functions should we talk about in the next couple of minutes? So we focused a lot on string functions uh, here today and kind of building out this table. Of course, there are functions for doing any kind of math thing you want. So there is a square root, SQR, it's called SQR. And that will tell you the square root of whatever number you give it. Um, absolute value, which returns the absolute value of whatever number you give it, right? So if we put a negative here, there are lots of these math functions. Um, I mean, anything you would want, expect to be able to do in math, there's probably a function built into it uh, already ready for you to use there in BBA. You just like, scan over what the BBA string functions are. See if anyone strikes my fancy that I should have told you about. Uh, so we didn't talk about uppercase. So there's a function called ucase, which just returns the uppercase value of something. There is also an lcase, which gives you the lowercase value of something. 
Just remind to talk about the rest of these hmm, format. So format's going to be used for uh, formatting different things. I don't know this one well enough off the top of my head to show it to you. All these different formats, mid, replace, write, split. Space is kind of an interesting one. Space will return a string consisting of the number of spaces that you suggest. So space 100 will give you a string with 100 spaces. So we've got 100 spaces there, uh, followed by an X. If you need to generate uh, you know, of a particular character other than space, you can always replace. Maybe you need 100 hyphens. So look for a space, replace it with a hyphen. And that's what you end up with. String compare and string convert. String compare is interesting because it will uh, give you the results of a string. Uh, it, it'll let you do case insensitive comparisons of strings. So that is kind of nice. Uh, string reverse just reverses a string. In the UK, so I think we've covered most of these. The ones we haven't covered are kind of obscure. All right, I think we'll call that good for today. We'll take one more chance at asking questions. I have a quick question. Yes, yeah, Spencer. So we kept copying that TXN, what does that do? Ah, so TXN is the identifier for the sheet that we're working on. So if we look at the sheet name, it says transactions, that's the, the name of the sheet here on the tab. And if I was going to refer to it like using the sheets method, or I don't think I've shown you that one yet, worksheets. Trans, here I -S -S -N -S, name, then you know, we're, we're evaluating that. But that's, so that's the name that I can refer to it by with its collection. But it also has a name that's built in. It's called the code name that I can just refer to it through code. And so that's just a fast way for me to be able to get to a reference to this sheet. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? Okay, folks, I'm hoping to see uh, uh, at least a good number of you uh, Saturday morning on Zoom for a review for the midterm. Um, because as you ask questions, I'll answer them. But if no one asks any questions, I won't have a whole lot to say. So come uh, with your, uh, your questions ready, and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer whatever you ask. All right. Thanks for coming. I hope to be uh, completely recovered from COVID. I actually feel pretty good uh, right now. But um, you know, I've got to be fever free for 24 hours once I've gone past 10 days of uh, my first symptoms. So Cross your fingers, should be back in class on Monday. All right, talk to you later. Bye-bye.